Praise the Lord, everybody. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. There's no other place we'd rather be than right here in his presence. For better is one day in your course, God, than a thousand elsewhere. Can you stand with us as we go before the Lord in worship? God, we enter into your presence with thanksgiving. We enter into your courts with great praise. We are forever thankful unto you, O oh God, and we bless your holy, matchless name. We thank you for what you've already begun in this conference. We're open. We know, Lord God, that these seeds that are being planted are falling on our hearts. Let our hearts be good soil, God. Anything that may have happened that tried to distract us or keep us from entering into your presence today, we take captive right now to every thought and every imagination that would try to exalt itself against you and the knowledge of who you are. Whatever we fought through to be here, we're here, oh God. And so we just thank you, Father, that we are here to worship you. We are here to lift your name. We are here to give you the glory that you alone deserve. So be glorified in this place. Be magnified in this place. Be glorified in this place. Have you God, have your way, for you're a God whose name is above all names. You have an amazing, incredible, beautiful, powerful, wonderful name, and so we lift you up in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Can you put those righteous hands together and give God a shout in here? Oh, 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 oh no. it up say oh oh
you are unchangeable, that you are invincible. And so God, if there's anybody in here that has a mountain that they need to go over, God, we know that those giants in front of us may seem insurmountable, but those mountains behind us show that we are capable. And so God, we speak to every mountain right here in this place. We speak to every you never change you are the most constant thing in our lives even when our emotions betray us when other things may disappoint us you are the adamant you are the constant you are the infinite you are everything we need you to be. So just lift those hands right here. And say, all mountains be moved. Chains now be loose. All mountains be moved. Chains now be loose. Can you lift it up? Come on. All mountains be moved. you glad that you serve a savior that loves you and doesn't leave you where you are you know you always hear the saints say I may not be where I want to be but aren't you glad you're not where you used to be because <laughs> he's a beautiful God he's an amazing God he's a forgiving God he's a restoring God so God we just worship you around your beautiful name, beautiful name, name. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high, you're hidden glory.
we just thank you for the power that we have access to through your name. Lord, we just thank you that in your presence there is the fullness of joy and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. We thank you for this encounter, this experience that we have on a Thursday morning set aside just for you, Lord. Nothing else will get in the way. We're open for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Can you put those hands together? Give God some praise. Hallelujah. Let's do the video.
Lisa Bevere's authentic and passionate teachings weave profound biblical truths with practical application. A New York Times best-selling author, her books are in the hands of millions worldwide. Lisa and her husband, John, are the founders of Messenger International, an organization committed to developing uncompromising followers of Christ who transform their world. I am going to allow the words of God to form what I say. We have to be a people who prophesy. Please welcome Lisa Bevere. Okay. Okay, so I'm with, I'm with the special ops women this morning. Is that correct? Okay, I'm super excited about being with you guys. Wow, again, we could just have worship and leave. It's amazing. It's so powerful. You know, Katie and I, my assistant, we were, uh, we were talking this morning about the incredible privilege that we've had to be here in this worship. Last night was just so filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was honored. He was allowed to inhabit our praises. It wasn't just a song sheet where we go through the three songs and then we're done. And I feel like the Holy Spirit has orchestrated every single aspect. And I believe that this morning, it will be no different. So I am honored and I am privileged to be with you guys. And you can high five a sister, hit her in the butt and sit down, sit down. Y'all can sit down, this is awesome. Okay, you guys are getting violent, wow. Wow, okay, that, that, that gave you guys some exceptional permission. Okay, I had no idea. Next time I won't go quite that far with it. Okay, so I just want you to know, I am a ridiculous person who has amazing children, and even more than that, an awesome God. And so everything I've ever learned in my life, I've learned the hard way. And so I believe in opening up my lives so that you can learn from my mistakes rather than repeating them. And we were talking in the makeup room. Don't I look pretty? Yeah, yeah, you guys. I mean, I'm look, that, like, put that picture down. I did not have a makeup artist for that picture. I have a makeup artist for this. I'm, from now on, when I get my picture done, I'm going to have a makeup artist done. And I'm telling you what, now, okay, and this is not racist, but I'm just going to tell you something. Black women know how to make other women more beautiful than white women do. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Anytime I've looked this good, it has been a black church. I've told my husband, I am so sorry for you that you are not here to see me in this moment, this moment of glory. I'm, I, I, won't see him till, I won't see him till Wednesday night, so I don't think it's going to last. But anyway, I did sleep on my back last night, try to keep most of it intact, but... Uh, yeah, they added more. They were like, no, we need another layer of glory for your face. I'm like, thank you. Us grandmas, we need all the help we can get. So I appreciated that. But I want to tell you a, a little bit of a story from me. So I wrote a book called Without Rival, and I'm so thrilled that I'm actually not aware, but the Holy Spirit is aware. My husband always tells me I am passive prophetic. He's like, you're prophetic by accident. You don't even know what you're saying. It just happens by accident. I'm like, okay. So I wrote a book called Without Rival, and I want to tell you the, the seed of that message. I was actually had just come home from South Korea, and it was such a quick turnaround that we did carry-on only. I mean, like, John and I both carry-on only, landed, had a news conference, preached a bunch of times, flew back home. And I live in a crazy world. I call my world the blessed blur. Somebody was talking to me about somebody. I was like, I don't know him. And they were saying, like, yeah, I think you do. And I was like, you're right. That was just last year. I was at their church. She taped me the name three times. Like, sounds familiar. So I live in a blur. Already this year, I have been to Thailand. I have been to Singapore. I have been to Sweden. I have been to Australia. I have been to New Zealand. And I have been to the UK. And I have been to Rio. And that was all the first three months. I'm so excited to be stateside right now. So I'm like, yay, last week, this time, no, last week, last Wednesday, I was with Hallmark Home and Family. Then I went from Hallmark Home and Family to TBN. 
recorded seven shows. Then I got on a plane at 6 a.m. last Friday morning, flew to Alabama, did Friday, did Saturday, did Sunday. Then I got on a plane, I flew up to Michigan, and then I was with Michigan for all Tuesday for a, like a men and women's leadership conference. And then I got on a plane yesterday, flew here. You know I needed a makeup artist. You know. In Michigan, they didn't put anything on me. Neither did Alabama. Okay, they needed to help me. So anyway, so I live in this blessed blur. And I was working on finishing a manuscript called Girls with Swords. And I was typing, and I fell asleep at my laptop. I know that because I woke up eight pages later of the letter T. And I was like, you know what? You, know, you just depressed one key. I was like unconscious. And I was like, I did the jerk, and I was like, you know what? This is, this is counterproductive. I need to lay down and take a nap. And I was just falling asleep. And don't run out of the building when I say this, because I'm going to explain it. I was just falling asleep when I heard the Holy Spirit say, I do not love my children equally. I jumped up from my bed, and I was like, you have to love us the same, or it wouldn't be fair. He said, same implies that one of you are replaceable. You know, I have four boys, and so I buy a lot of the same glasses because I know that those glasses are going to need to be replaced, and I can go back to that same place and get the same glasses. I'm sorry. None of us are replaceable in the heart of God. Equal implies that his love could be measured. I don't know if you know this. But our father doesn't have love for you. He's not even in love with you. He is love for you. And God has loved you with an everlasting love. What does that mean? It means he has an infinite love for you. That when he was weaving you in your mother's womb, he already loved you. Do you know that he was weaving, we talked about last night, eternity in your heart. And he said, I will love this girl, not equally. I will love her uniquely. See, God doesn't love us equally. He loves us uniquely. How many of you have more than one child? Wave at me. Okay, well, I had my first baby. I was like, oh, my gosh. I want 20 of these I am so in love with my firstborn son. I was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea I could ever love someone this much. And my husband was like, I will impregnate you. And so I got <laughs> pregnant with the second son. And near the end of my pregnancy, I began to panic. First and foremost, because pregnant women are weird. But I began to panic because I began to imagine that this second son that I was carrying was going to mean that I was going to have to cut the love I had for my first son in half and share it equally. And I was like, I know how I feel about Addison, but I don't know how I feel about this stranger baby that looks like an alien in the sonogram. I don't know how I feel about him. But when I gave birth to Austin, something new opened up in my heart that had never been alive before. And the things I love about Addison are very different than the things I love about Austin. And the things I love about Austin is different than what I love about Alec. And the things I love about Alec are different than the things I love about Arden. I love each of my sons uniquely because they are uniquely created. And so God knows that I have a computer game fetish. See, I don't play Candy Crush. I play with the Merriam-Webster dictionary app. I begin to match words to their meanings. I love words. And so what did I do when he said, I don't love my children equally, I love them uniquely? I jumped up, went into my husband's office where I am forbidden to be, and I went on the app for Merriam-Webster dictionary. And I found out there is a three-tier definition for this word unique. Number one. Soul representative of. Do you know that you are the only one who was created to represent God the way you will represent God? Do you know that you are the only one 
who can, he can manifest his love through you for this world in a unique way. And he will actually also manifest his love for you to this world in a unique way. Soul representative. Number two, you are the prototype. Unique means prototype. You are the beginning and the end of you. There will never be another one of you, even identical twins do not have the same fingerprints. You are the beginning and the end of you. But the third tier definition was my favorite, without rival. There is no competition for your place in the heart of God. There is no competition for your place at the table. We were singing it, you have no rival. You have no equal. Well, if our God has no rival and he has no equal, then it would stand to reason that we who are his sons and daughters have no rival and we have no equal. But I don't know if you know how all of this nonsense started because it started way before the fall in a garden. It started with a rivalry where Satan said, I will ascend. I will be like the most high. And when God perceived what was in his heart, till he would un ascend, that rivalry actually unmade him. And we are seeing the same thing happen in our earth right now. Because rivalry is robbing not only the body of Christ, but our nation. Do you understand there is a divisive spirit that wants to set the men at odds with the women? It wants to set the white against the black. Do you understand that that divisive spirit is going to push on the pressure points on all of the races and say, you will never be safe. This is going to be a forever problem. No, it's not going to be a forever problem because you and I serve the Prince of Peace. And because we bow our knee to the Prince of Peace, we're going to make sure we're all at the table to bring some solution. And while the men are being territorial, I'm not trying to be mean. The women need to be relational because at the end of the day, it's about our children. And so we are not going to allow, we are not going to allow our children to inherit this ridiculousness. It's a bunch of nonsense. It's awful. Divided. Dividing authorities. Dividing parents from children. There's division going on. So we have to expose it. First and foremost, in our own heart. If I believe that God has no rival, then I have to believe that I have no rival. And I need to stop seeing other people that God wants to be, to be in relationship with as rivals. And I need to see them differently. And I need to confront it first by receiving his love for me. And then when I receive his love for me, when I receive this adamant, fearless love of God, then because I receive this fearless love, I can love fearlessly. And people who love fearlessly can live fearlessly. You cannot live fearlessly until you learn to love fearlessly. Because the opposite of fear is not faith. The opposite of fear is love. Because you can have faith in your fears, and they will happen. But when you walk in love, love cannot fail. And so we need to understand this time period that we're in. And we need to do some deep work in our hearts. So I wrote a book called Without Rival. It's about identity, and it's about purpose. And I don't know if you understand that you can never step into your identity or your purpose until you deal with rivalries in your heart, until you deal with competition, until you deal with comparison, until you deal with minimizing other people. We have to be women who begin to lift each other up. And so we need to shift things in the spirit. But we begin again with ourselves. And so uh, I wrote this book. I'm going to tell you the privilege I've had. Over the last two years, I have had the privilege of standing in front of close to 200,000 millennials. Do you know how amazing that is? Okay, I am so thrilled that as a Sicilian grandmother, I get to talk to millennials. I was telling Pastor Mona, I said, just this spring, I will do six Youth conferences, six. Why? I don't know. Maybe they can hear something from a grandmother that they won't hear from a mother. Because, see, mother's in a different position than grandma is in, in their mindset. 
And so here's the thing. I love millennials. I think millennials are amazing. I birthed four of them. So I love millennials. Millennials are, are some of the most well-educated, well-connected people on the face of the earth. And at the same time, they're some of the most confused. I'm not saying that mean. Okay, you guys, let's talk about this. When I was getting ready to marry my husband, I had two options. The Christian guy with a job or the Christian guy without a job. I was like, I'll take the Christian guy with the job. Yeah, you'll always take the Christian guy with a job. If that's a default answer. But here's the thing. They got 300,000 different guys on Instagram that they don't even know. See, they have so many connections, but so little FaceTime. Facebook does not count as FaceTime, face-to-face relationships. And so I'll preach, and afterwards they'll come up to me and they'll be shaking. And they'll say, I know that God has his hand on my life for something significant. And I'll say, I believe that. And they'll say, but I have no idea what it is. They're so afraid of making mistakes that they have frozen. And I will grab them by the shoulders and I will look them in the eyes and I say two things. You will never discover your purpose in the presence of people. You will only discover your purpose in the presence of God. And the presence of God requires that we step back out of the presence of people and step into moments like we had last night in worship. And those corporate moments are important. But you know what? I dance at home alone. I dance in my hotel room alone. No, my boys don't want to see it. My husband probably would, but he doesn't get to. And so what do I do? I make sure that I am fully engaged with the presence of God. Do you know what else I do? I pray in tongues. Oh, yeah, that's not something popular anymore, but I'm sorry. Praying in the Holy Spirit will build up your inner man. Praying in the Holy Ghost out loud and strong. I have a a young girl that sees me kind of as a spiritual covering in her life, and she was writing a book about sexual purity. And I'm in the shower, and the Holy Spirit says, you call her right now, and you ask her if she is filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. So I tried to call her. She didn't answer. So I text her. I said, are you filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues? And she said, well, no. And I said, you get someone to lay hands on you right away. You cannot go into this battle and not have the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. And she's well, I've been seeking it for two years. I said, well, here's a mama saying to you, it's time. And sometimes a mama has to say to the next generation, baby girl, you don't have what you need to go into this battle because flesh and blood is not what you are going to be fighting. You are going to be fighting principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness and high places. And we have a weapon without rival. It is praying in the Holy Spirit and it is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I know we're all so smart right now and we all are so busy tweeting things. But there is something that happens when you pull on something that is beyond your understanding. When you begin to pray a mystery and prophesy and answer, do you understand that we can speak the sword of the Spirit and we can pray an angelic language? So she said, well, over in two weeks, I'm going to go visit my family. And that'll happen. I said, I don't want you to wait two weeks. And so that night, she's with two friends. And she said, do either of you pray in the Holy Spirit? speaking in tongues. And one of them, and I'm just going to say she was his sister, she said, I do. And I've been praying for you that you would get it. And she laid hands on her, and she got the Holy Spirit and fire. And fire. She said she shook for two hours just in somebody's house. Somebody's a house. It doesn't have to be a service. Somebody's house. Okay. I don't even know why I said all that. Anyway, okay, so some of you, some of you aren't praying in the Holy Ghost enough. I'm sorry, some of you aren't. You're allowing your understanding to form your prayers. You cannot pray according to the understanding and the news. You have to pray according to thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and then pray in the Holy Spirit. We need to do this. 
We need to do this. We have to do this. And then you need to ask for some gifts. You need to ask God for some gifts. You know, my husband prayed for me to be born again and filled with the Holy Spirit on my very first date with him. Okay, and, and so he said, you know, now you're a Christian. I said, what does that mean? He said, it means you're saved. I said, what does that mean? He said, it means you're whole again. I said, so now I can have cheese. And he's like, what? I said, you just said that I was whole again, spirit, soul, and body. I can't eat dairy products. I'm Italian. I need to eat dairy products. He was like, God, if you can save this heathen, you can heal this heathen. And so all, all of the knots in my stomach were untied. Then he said, now there's something else. It's called the infilling, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I said, will it bring me closer to God? He said, yes. I said, sure. Then he started praying in tongues. I'm like, that is not going to work in my sorority. I cannot do that. I thought it was going to be like epileptic seizure. I was going to be in the lines at McDonald's. All of a sudden, I'd be praying in tongues out loud. He goes, no, no, no. So I said, okay, I'm going to have to think about this one. <laughs> Went back to my dorm room, began to study the word of God. I began to see all these other gifts. I'm like, I don't want tongues. I want the work in a miracles, maybe prophecy, maybe words of knowledge, words of wisdom. So I met up with him, and I was like, I'm sorry you settled for tongues, but I'm going to take one of these other ones. And he was like, Lisa, you don't have to choose. The Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is given to all to, to, to build up their faith. And so I, I, it took me two weeks to get my brain around it. But then when I got it, I was so thankful for the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost isn't weird. The Holy Ghost will actually stand you up on your feet and give you strength and give you boldness and give you insight. We have the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit without rival. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We want to move with the Holy Spirit of God. So anyway, I was, I don't even know what I was saying now. Anyway, so I, going back to this whole idea of without rival, we got we to confront it. So after I got done with Girls With Swords and after all these different things, I began to see this identity. Oh, I'll tell you the second thing. Okay, this is what it was. Okay, I remember now. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Okay, so the second thing with the millennials is they don't know what they're called to do because they're called to do something that has never been done before. And that requires the Holy Spirit. That requires a heavenly alignment. And I almost feel like God is like, I'm not going to tell you I'm not going to tell you until you rightly align with the older generation because I don't know if you understand what the book of Acts says. The book of Acts says in chapter 2, verse 17, that in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. And he said that your sons and your daughters will what? Prophesy. What does that mean? What does that mean to prophesy? Because see, right now I see the church criticizing I don't see the church prophesying. It takes absolutely no anointing to criticize, but it takes faith and anointing to prophesy. We need a generation who will walk the face of the earth and release the words of heaven. Not my opinion. Not what I'm feeling in that moment. In my menopausal mean. But what I am actually hearing the Spirit of God say. We need to be those women who will say, we want to be a Samuel generation where not one word we speak will fall to the ground unfulfilled. So, anyway, so I, I believe that destiny is tied to knowing who God is. Because when we find out who God is, we find out who we are. And too many people are trying to find out what they're called to do without knowing who they are. And you will never know what without knowing who and you will never know who without knowing whose. And so we have to know whose we are so we can find out who we are, so we can find out what we're called to do. So that is the kind of the tension that we have in our day. So um, I have an embarrassing story about myself. It does involve coffee as well as the one last night, which wasn't quite as embarrassing as this one is. So I live in Colorado. We had a blizzard yesterday. Hey, awful. You had a heat wave, we had a blizzard. I brought you the warmth. I took it from Colorado, and I brought it here for you. So anyway, I sleep all night so that I can drink coffee in the morning. I get up. I have a fluffy polar fleece robe on. Y'all understand those here in Boston. I put on my Ugg slippers, and I shuffle out to my espresso machine, and I just hover over it. I make three shots of espresso. I get whipped cream. I put it on the top. Then I open the drawer where I have a block 
of completely pure, dark chocolate. I get a knife out. I shave dark chocolate on top of the whipped cream. Then I put some raw sugar, and I put some cinnamon. And if it's really cold out, I put cayenne pepper. And then I pick it up, and I'm like, yes, this is going to happen. The first sip with the whipped cream is always the best sip. And I was like, yes. My kids were gone. I was floating down to the sofa. I was going to pick up my A.W. Tozier devotional when I made a fatal error. I picked up my phone instead. I decided I would go to Twitter, that it would be kind of like having coffee with friends. And I began to go through my Twitter feed. And as I was going through my Twitter feed, I noticed a common thread among my friends. All of my friends were thanking somebody for putting them on a particular list. So what was my reaction? I went immediately to the list to see if I was on the list. Now, when your last name starts with B, you find out really quick whether you are on the list or not. Why would I want to be on this list? Well, this was the list of the top 100 female ministers in the United States. When I saw that my name wasn't on the list, I went into immediately a hot flash. I went flying into my husband's office. He was being a Christian. He was reading his Bible. I came in there like a polar fleece flurry. I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't make the list. I'm never gonna make the list. I'm 56 or 50, maybe not 54. I'm 54 and I'm never going to make the list. And John just kind of calmly looks at me and he's like, what are you talking about? And I told him. And then he said, do you know the person? That, do you even know the person that made this list? And I said, no. And he said, I said, I need your phone. And he's like, why do you need my phone? I said, because at the end of the list, they said that perhaps they have forgotten somebody. And he was like, no, 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 you put your phone down right now. And he said, you need to go read your Bible. And I stomped my foot and I said, I know I'm wrong but that doesn't make this feel right. And so what did I do? I took off my slippers and I put on my Ugg boots and I went outside in four inches of snow and I called my friend, Christine came. I called her and I said, you're not gonna even believe this. You're not gonna even believe this. And I told her, I said, can you believe, I, I didn't make the list. And she's like, first question, did I make the list? And I'm like, yeah, Christine, yeah, you made the list and you're not even American. I said, Christine, people that translated my books from English to Spanish made the list. It's like they are saying, we're not putting Lisa on the list. Well, Christine was just quiet. I, I know better now. If I want sympathy, I'm calling Mona. I'm not calling Christine. <laughs> Mona would have added me to the list as I was on the phone. She'd be like, girlfriend, I got this taken care of. You are now 101 on the list. <laughs> So now, so now I'm mad at the list, I'm mad at my husband, I'm mad at Christine. So I go in the house, I'm like, you know what? Maybe I'll just make my own list. <laughs> Maybe I'll make my own list. I got more Twitter followers than this list maker. Maybe I'll make my own list. And then I was like, that is not Jesus. That is menopause mean and you need to stop right now. Then I started thinking, Dad, that's right, I'm not going to do that because lists are wrong. Lists are always leaving somebody off. And then I heard the Holy Spirit say, and yet, if you had been on it, it would have been valid. He said, you would have retweeted it, and you would have posted it. And I was like, I am so busted. So I went into my room, I hit my knees, I'm like, Jesus, I'm acting like I'm in junior high. I'm so sorry for being ridiculous. I went and I told my husband, baby, it's okay. I put an estrogen patch on my hip. <laughs> I feel like everybody's safe now. I texted Christine. I was like, sorry about that outburst. It was a confession more than a confrontation. And then I just started to move through my day. And uh, my assistant came. This seems to be a recurring theme in my life. My assistant came and she said, you got an unusual gift. And I said, oh, okay. And she said, apparently, you were not able to attend an event, and they decided to make a plastic doll out of you and put it as a centerpiece 
on the table. Thank you for not doing that to me, Mona. Thank you for just asking me again. I'm going to show you this plastic doll. It is ridiculous. I have burnt this outfit. I don't know what I was thinking. I thought it was cool. This is a really old picture. My mouth is open. What in the world? You can see my husband in the background. It's like 12 inches tall. And so I picked this up, and the Holy Spirit said, well, now you're a plastic doll. Are you happy? And I was like, uh-uh, I'm throwing this thing away. My husband took it from me. He was like, uh-uh, no, 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 we are keeping this. We are keeping this, and if this ever comes up again, the doll will make a reappearance in your life. I have to ask you, what is going on? But here's what happens. When you and I decide to measure ourselves outside of the standard of God, we will always end up flat, two-dimensional, and fake. Pastor Tim Keller said, we want someone of ultimate glory loving us, not just love in general. What we need is this ultimate assurance of who we are, the ultimate assurance of our worth. We need someone like that loving us like that. We need someone we think the world of thinking the world of us. We need the praise of the praiseworthy. See, our God doesn't tolerate you. He wasn't thinking of somebody else when he created you. He wove you in his imagination and his heart first. And I get it that some of us are like, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? And he was like, baby girl, I wasn't thinking about the vapor. I was thinking about eternity. So we have to understand that comparison does have a pull to it. What was the scripture that my husband wanted me to read? 2 Corinthians 10, 12, Paul is warning us not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. There are three C's mentioned here, comparison, classifying, self-commending, and those four, three led to a fourth. It is called compromise. Compromise. We should not classify. Do you know what classify means? It means to brand. It means to sort. It means to label. Have you ever been labeled by somebody? Because the labels are very limiting. I remember when John and I first started in the ministry, an older, wiser man sat us down and he said, don't you ever let anybody label you because as soon as they can label you, they will disqualify you. He said, you make sure you always move in the spirit. I'm going to tell you some of the labels I fought in my life. I fought the label that I heard that women are the last to be created, first to sin, that women are gullible and easily deceived. And do you know what? I had been all those things. I had sinned. I had had deception. I had been foolish with stuff. So you know what I did? I let that label just kind of stick on the backside of my thigh, just kind of dragged around with me. And then I started having spiritual daughters. And then I started having granddaughters. And I began to think how I would feel if somebody said to my Sophia, that she was the last to be created and the first to sin, that she was easily deceived. You know, they get halfway through that sentence because I would jump on top of them. I would tackle them. I would be sitting on their chest and my hand would be over their mouth and I would say, don't you dare speak those limiting labels over my baby girl. But here's where that starts. It didn't start with me protecting my granddaughter. It starts with me removing my own labels. Because see, the labels I wear in front of my daughters is the labels that they will wear. And so I have to strip off those labels. I can't embrace the labels of men or women or titles. I have to embrace a relationship with the living God. And so we need to strip off the labels. One of the terms for classify means to pigeonhole. I'm sorry. I don't want to be pigeonholed to what I've been when the limitless God is calling me into a position 
where he wants to astound the world through his faithfulness. I'm not going to pray according to what I have experienced. I'm going to pray according to what I see in my spirit. Second one is compare. Compare. What happens when we compare ourselves? Well, Theodore Roosevelt said it the best. He said, comparison is the thief of joy. Maybe this is just a white girl thing, but, you know, occasionally, occasionally I get to go on a date with my husband. It's very occasionally. And maybe we go to a movie. And I'm sitting there in the movie, and I'm watching how this guy is kissing his fake wife. And I'm like, when was the last time my husband kissed me like that? My husband never kisses me like that. I'm watching a movie, and I'm getting mad at my husband because he doesn't kiss me like that. He doesn't do this with me anymore. He doesn't do that with me. Well, I've learned that is counterproductive. If that man isn't kissing you the way you wish he would kiss you, you grab him and you kiss him. You grab him and you kiss him. Do not let comparison rob you. If you see God doing something amazing in your sister, don't you think it was taken out of your bank account? Don't you think it was taken out of your blessing vault? If you see God doing something amazing in somebody else's life, you say that just means he can do the same or more for me. You get excited when you see your sisters getting blessed. Are we not all part of the same body? So we should rejoice when we see somebody having favor, when we see somebody being loved, when we see somebody going through a good thing, instead of being secretly happy when they go through a bad. Well, I always knew she had a little bit of a whatever going on there. No, we cannot be those women. We are last days women. We are not women who are going to open our mouths with meanness. We are going to open our mouths with kindness. I believe that comparison is a refuge for the cowardly who refuse to believe there is something more than what they have seen. We cannot be content with what we have known or what we have seen. God is asking a generation to cry out for something more than what they've seen or what they have been. Then the next one is commend, self-commend. This has become an art form right now in the body of Christ. People take pictures of themselves. They're like, look at me. Oh, this is me, no filter. This is me. Oh, my gosh, I'm so excited about what's happening. Right? Do you know on purpose, I post ugly pictures of myself because I feel like every time I post an ugly picture, I set people free. They're like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I showed Mona. I said, Mona, you want to see what my hair really looks like? And, and she was like, oh, I'm sure it's beautiful. She was like, I said, yeah. Yeah, I got, I got sister hair. Like when I let my hair dry by itself and then blow dry it, it looks like a poodle that had a perm. It's terrifying. 940 comments later on my Instagram. People are praying for me. People are sending me products. People are saying I just got free. Why? Because I don't want to post things that makes other people feel less than. And this self-commending means you already got your reward. My Bible says that we are supposed to not receive the praises of people. I'm supposed to live for the well done, good and faithful servant, which is why it was so embarrassing that I was trying to make a list made by people. John 5, says, how do you expect to get anywhere with God when you spend all your time jockeying for position with each other, ranking your rivals and ignoring God? And then the last part of 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. Hey, we're not supposed to measure ourselves by anybody but Jesus. We're not supposed to compare ourselves with anybody but what God is telling us to do. So many people are talking about running in your own lane, but I'm going to tell you something. If you actually ask God, to do certain things in your life, then there's going to be things he's going to take away from you that he still allows other people to do. If you say, I want the power of God, I want more of you in my life, he's like, okay, if you want to increase capacity, then I need an increased consecration. And so this is what's happening in our lives. Nobody knows the price that people pay, pay in private. Nobody knows everybody else's pain. Everybody's life is a lot more messy and complicated than any of us can see from the outside. And so we need to actually be very merciful 
with one another. I'm going to read this scripture to you because I believe it describes our day. Galatians 5.19 from the message. It says that it is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impetus to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. Uncontrolled and uncontrollable addiction, ugly parodies of community. I could go on. This isn't the first time I have warned you, you know. If you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is what our culture looks like. I don't know who you voted for, but I have never seen a president more dishonored than the president we have right now. You know what the Bible says? Don't speak evil of the king of your people, the leader of our people. We're supposed to pray for them. I'm telling you what, we need to be praying, praying. And don't say, well, you all didn't pray for Obama. You don't know what I did. You don't know what I did. We need to pray that somehow God is going to take what we have right now, and he's going to break it, and he's going to bless it. But my Bible makes it very clear. It has nothing to do with an election. It says, if my people are called by my name, what do we have to do? Humble ourselves. And what else do we do? And what else do we do? And what else do we do? Turn from our own wicked ways. We don't have to turn the world. We got to turn from our own wicked ways. And then God says, I will hear from heaven. And I will heal the land. We do not need another election. We need a healing. We need a healing of our land. Okay, now I'm supposed to have a countdown clock, and all I got is time right now, so I'm going to keep talking forever unless y'all give me a clock. Now they're all going to panic. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this because I, I want to set you up well to go into this conference so that you know what actually needs to happen next. When we stop this whole dynamic of comparison, then we can have the right conversations with the right people. Do you know that even now your enemy is trying to alienate you from people that actually you're supposed to build with? That he is actually trying to keep you from aligning, aligning with the people you need to align with. And that means there's going to be uncomfortable conversations. But I'm going to close with this story from Genesis because I believe it's where the women in the church are right now. In Genesis chapter 17, I'm going to just paraphrase it for the sake of time. God appears to Abraham. And he says to Abraham, I'm going to give you an heir. I'm going to make this promise. And what happens with Abraham? He's like, I'm so excited for Ishmael. And God's like, no, I'm sorry. It's not Ishmael. It's not Hagar. It's Sarah. And it's Isaac. And Abraham is the first one to laugh at that. He laughs. We all get mad at Sarah. Oh, stupid Sarah laughing. Abraham was the first one to laugh. He says to him, a year from now, a year from now, Sarah will have a son. Now we come into Genesis 18, and angels have just walked by Abraham's tent. And Abraham grabs them and is like, hey, hey, guys, just pause a moment, and I'll fix a little something, something for you. But you know what? He goes way over. He does what all of us should do. He under-promises and over-delivers. He kills a calf. He gets his best grains. Everybody has a feast spread out. Now the angels and a lot of people would say this is Christ. This is Jesus as well are sitting there and they're eating and the first thing they do is they say the men said to him, where is Sarah your wife? And he said in the tent. One of them said I'm coming back about this time. So it wasn't this time. Now it's about this time. It might have been a week. It might have been two weeks. I don't know what it been. About this time next year. And when I arrive, your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent opening just behind the men. 
Abraham and Sarah were old by this time, very old. Sarah was far past the age for having babies. Sarah laughed within herself. Abraham laughed out loud. An old woman like me get pregnant with this old man of a husband. That's why I picked this one. I love that. God said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, me, have a baby. An old woman like me is anything too hard for God. I'll be back about this time next year, and Sarah will have a baby. Sarah lied. She said, I didn't laugh because she was afraid. But he said, yes, you did. You laughed. Now I'm going to point out some things that you guys might have seen before that I never saw before. But it begins with, where is Sarah, your wife? Mona comes to my house and knocks on the front door, and John answers. She's not going to say, where is Lisa, your wife? Because she knows me. She's going to say, where is Lisa? Now, if somebody comes to my house trying to sell me something, they don't know me, and my husband answers, and they think I'm the weakest link, they're going to say, where is the little woman? Where is your wife? But the fact that they paired Sarah and wife tells us something. That Abraham and Sarah had forgotten that they were husband and wife. I can prove that because in the chapter before, he had say, lie and tell you, you are my sister. And then in Abimelech, right after God had said, in less than a year, she's going to get prayed, he puts her in a harem and says, say that you're my sister. They were living together like brother and sister. And Mona, I'm going to say to you, there is something that happens when you and your husband live as husband and wife and not brother and sister. And some of you have settled for a passionless relationship. You need to remember you are husband and wife, and if you're like, I'm a single girl, well, then Jesus is your bridegroom, and it's supposed to be passionate. It's supposed to be well-connected. And then the next interesting thing he says is he says, Sarah, he says to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why didn't he say, Sarah, why did you laugh? He's like, Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? It's because Abraham had never told Sarah what God had said. And see, here's what God is doing with the women. He's like, this is not a season for you to hide in the tent and listen in on conversations you are meant to be part of. I need you to stop laughing at the promise of God. I need you to stop making it about your old man. I need you to stop understanding that God wants to do something new in your life. And I'm also going to put a little bit of time frame on it. I'm going to say a year from now. A year from now, that promise that you've been longing for, but that promise that you've been actually undermining with your words. A year from now, if you will change your conversation. A year from now, if you will stop depersonalizing people. A year from now, if you will stop competing and comparing, God is going to do something that is going to astound you, and you will hold in your arms the promise that you have waited for for so long. But that conversation needs to happen. And you need to stop listening in. And you need to step back in. And I understand why Sarah listened in. Sarah had the mindset a lot of us have. Sarah had been crazy. Do you understand all the stupid things Sarah had done? Do you know Sarah was the one that said, hey, I got a great idea. How about you take my handmaid and sleep with her and I'll raise up the baby as my own. Didn't work well. And then when Hagar gets pregnant, what does Sarah do? She beats a pregnant woman. Okay, that's a crazy woman. A crazy woman beating a pregnant woman. It got you, yeah, that's a whole nother level. Beating a crazy woman, beating a pregnant woman. God has to send an angel. Hagar, go back to the crazy woman who beat you. So here's what Sarah was. Now, she's seeing Abraham's bonded with Ishmael. Ishmael has not bonded with me. And she's like, I've made some serious mistakes. And this is what happens when you make mistakes. You begin to think you are a mistake. But if you think you are a mistake, you are mistaken. And here's what I have learned from this passage. Baby girl, you are not powerful enough to get yourself out of the plan of God. God will actually step into your future. And yes, you may have made it harder, but he will begin to redeem something. You cannot blow the plan that God has on your life unless you stay hiding in the tent and laughing and lying. You are not content with what you've seen. You are not content with what you have known. Your sister is not taking your blessing. 
You need to press into God. You need to take the promise from God. So I need you to stand up because you and I live in a time period that is without rival. We live in a time period that is pregnant with opportunity. We live in a time period where God needs you to actually pray in such a big way that you actually show him that you believe that there is nothing too hard for them. And I want you to hold up that promise before you. And I want you to say, Heavenly Father, I believe that a year from now, everything can be different. God, I'm going to watch what I say. I'm going to watch what I do. I'm going to consecrate myself. I'm going to stop thinking because I've made mistakes. I am a mistake. This isn't about me. This is about you. God, I want to be your daughter. Alive in this time without rival. Destined for an eternity without rival. I receive your love that is without rival. And I will love fearlessly. And I will live fearlessly. And I will believe again fearlessly. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If this spoke to you at all, I bought this book, Without Rival. I only brought Adamant and Without Rival. I said this is about identity and this is about truth. I felt like that was what I was supposed to bring. I have 14 books. I could have brought any other books and your pastor showed me. She said, this is what you're speaking into right here. This is what's getting ready to happen. So you have been seated. Don't you dare settle for the list of people when your name has been written in the list of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Don't you make it about what you're not invited to when you've been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Woo! Hallelujah. Well, I, I just, I just want to say before Lisa goes down that on Sunday I was sitting here and I was sitting next to Vivian. I don't know if you're here, but uh, her husband. And he said, Mona, when you came into the service during worship, I heard the Lord tell, tell me to tell you something, but I, I was nervous. And so now that I'm home, I still hear that voice, and so I had to share this with you. You have to mark this day, April 29th. One year, God is going to give you the thing you have been dreaming about your entire life. I'm telling you, God is in this place. Every meeting, every encounter, every word that is spoken today, God is telling us that we are without rival. Our sisters are not our competition. Every word that we speak over the next couple of days, they're like rain falling from heaven. So be very careful the words that you speak because water is falling on them. And we are calling forth good fruit. We're calling forth good flowers, not weeds. So God, we just rest in this moment in the command that Lisa, the charge that she's given us. God, I thank you that one year from today, based on what we cast before you, it will happen. We believe, we are those that believe what you say. God, we thank you for this appointed time. I don't care that it didn't happen in 2005, 2006, 2007, but you ordained for Lisa to be here to speak what thus saith the Lord in this season. Let us not take it for granted. Let us run our race with perseverance. God, we thank you. In Jesus' name.